good evening or good morning from whenever wherever which part of the world you are i am extremely thankful to professor sareen professor tanwandi professor omata and professor law for giving me this opportunity and this is the apasal hepatology episode 4 session 1 welcome you all and we have the pleasure of having with us professor michael mans professor mans is president of hanover medical school hanover germany since 2019 since 1991 he is the director of department of gastroenterology hepatology and endocrinology at hanover medical school he has a long term research interest in varied liver diseases with main focus on viral hepatitis autoimmune hepatitis hepatocellular carcinoma liver transplant regenerative medicine and cellular therapies he is the founder and chairman of hepnet which is a national network on viral hepatitis and the german river foundation he has been president of german society of liver diseases german society of gastroenterology german society of internal medicine united european gastroenterology he has won various international awards including the hans popper prestigious award in 1995 and the easel recognition award in 2007 he has published more than 1000 papers in best of the international peer reviewed journals like new england journal lancet nature gastroenterology hepatology among others he has a big h index of 163 and thomson reuters ranks him among the top 1% of most cited researchers in clinical medicine today we have the pleasure of having him and he will be deliberating on the topic of autoimmune hepatitis what is new in this field professor michael mans please yeah wait a minute i just share my screen Okay, thank you very much for this kind introduction. Uh I'm you're correct. I'm president of Hanover Medical School since 2019 and I'm director emeritus of uh, the department which I handed over to Heiner Wiedemeyer in April this year. Uh I have a long-term interest in autoimmune hepatitis and liver diseases and I also will allude to the latest guidelines of the American Association for the Study of the Liver where I have been a co-author and I will discuss this with you. I give acknowledgement to Richard Taubert who uh, helped me and worked with me for many years in this field. He's an uh, principal investigator himself. I have a conflict of interest to declare and uh, would like to start now uh, for those not familiar with the disease it's uh, one of the rare liver diseases uh it occurs in all age groups although we have two peaks in the younger age and children below 20 and another one about about 40 uh, among the characteristics are histological markers like interface hepatitis although blood vessel infiltration rosette formation however there's no particular among histological pictures typical is hypergammaglobulinemia in the absence of cirrhosis a predominance of females and characteristic autoantibodies i will come back to this here are the classical autoantibodies nuclear smooth muscle and lkm which can be discovered by fluorescence the incidents there have been originally very few data mainly from northern european countries but there is increasing evidence that the incidence of autoimmune hepatitis is increasing in most countries Here are data from Denmark. Uh, below you see Germany is increasing, uh, Iceland. Uh, so obviously we see an increase in autoimmune hepatitis. The pathophysiology. Uh, something is known. Uh, we do not know enough to have uh, sufficient treatment. I will concentrate on this in the following part of my talk. So we have the idea that there is a genetic predisposition. and that environmental factors trigger a loss of tolerance against the patient's uh, own liver uh, we have uh, studied the genetic background for many many years mhc2 locus dr3 dr4 uh, we have uh, immunoregulation we have non mhc genes associated tnf polymorphism vitamin d receptor polymorphism however the genetic background accounts only about 50% of the risk and then we have infections toxins and heterologous immunity and molecular mimicry this all triggers uh, the self perpetuating immune process lately 
regulatory T cells have uh, received a lot of attention in the studies on the pathophysiology, like in other autoimmune diseases. Uh, this is data showing that there's no numerical dysfunction of intrahepatic T-Rex, but that T-Rex um, decrease selective T-Rex depletion under standard immunosuppressive therapy, uh, which you can on the right side. Here you can see this. Um, then also we have um, studies on IL-2. IL-2 can stimulate regulatory T cells and therefore IL-2 has been studied uh, as a surrogate marker for uh, the function uh, of regulatory T lymphocytes because uh, IL-2 may be used as a therapeutic agent. This we will discuss later on. And here you see data on uh, IL-2 serum levels. There already have been published two cases where low-dose IL-2 was used as a therapeutic agent. So what is new about the diagnosis? There's not too much new. We based the diagnosing on histological clinical characteristics and autoantibodies. There are various scoring systems and the latest American guidelines, ASLD guidelines, uh, they clearly stated that these scoring system, uh, the sophisticated of the 90s and the simplified of 2000 should just be used um, if uh, for, for classifying cohorts of patients for clinical trials and for patients where the diagnosis is difficult. Uh, what is new is that uh, the pediatricians, they pointed out that uh, the autoimmune hepatitis in uh, children needs to have particular attention to three aspects. Number one, autoantibody titles are lower. And you see this here is a publication in the Journal of Pediatrics, Gastroenterology and Nutrition. And uh, that there are lower autoantibody titles and in particular, Georgina Mielivergani and group from London, they pointed out that the overlap in the pediatric population is rather frequent with sclerosing cholangitis, which they called uh, ASC, autoimmune sclerosing cholangitis. And therefore, they think that the cholangiogram is obligatory to exclude this condition. And uh, the genetic background is particularly high in children where LKM antibody type 2 is frequent. And there you have a high predominance of autoimmune disorders in family history. This is now a cartoon from the American guidelines of 2019 published in 2020. I was a co-author and a member of the writing crew. Uh, I was the lead author in 2010. These are now the updated ones. And, uh, and this, this uh, algorithm for diagnosis uh, the idea was to have autoantibodies and histology head to head. You have first the, uh, the immunofluorescence antibodies, ANA, SMA, and then in particular in pediatric patients, LKM1. And then if they are negative, then you should look for other antibodies and SLA, which I described in 1987, and which was cloned by Ansel Loser. I think this is also now used in these negative for classical autoantibodies. And then you have the liver biopsy, you have interface hepatitis and plasma cells, which support the diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis. But you also should look at bile ducts to diagnose overlap syndromes. And what the autoimmune, uh, what the group of the ASLD really highlighted in their guidelines is that nowadays with increase of waste and obesity in many parts of the world, that there an overlap you have between autoimmune hepatitis and fatty liver disease, which has to be excluded and therefore biopsy should be mandatory when making the diagnosis. There is uh, certainly a small proportion of patients who are autoantibody negative, but they have, should have hypergammaglobulinemia, the absent cirrhosis, and here immunosuppressive treatment is part of the diagnostic procedure, as also mentioned in the scoring systems. So when we come now to treatment, uh, it's very important to note that the goal of treatment is clinical, biochemical, and histological remission. Since the 2010 ASLD guidelines, normalization of ALT plus normalization of IgG is the goal of treatment. And this is a recent publication from Italy showing that patients who do not achieve normalization of IgG and ALT 
they have a decreased life expectancy. So this is really highlighting that we, with every effort, we should try to achieve complete remission. This is now taken from the latest ASRD guidelines, the standard of care is brednisone or brednisolone in adults 20 to 40 milligram in pediatrics 1 to 2 milligram per kilogram body weight plus azathioprine. And it should be started with prednisone and then azathioprine added after two weeks. And uh, an alternative is budesonide. I come back to this uh, topical steroids. This can only be used in non cirrhotic patients. Um, in patients with cirrhosis, you should only start with prednisone or prednisolone, different dosages in pediatrics and adults. And if there's a response after two weeks, you should add azathioprine. And here is recommended now that you should look for TPMT activity to rule out um, forehand side effects. And then there's a separate group, and this is acute severe autoimmune hepatitis. If autoimmune hepatitis presents as acu uh, um, acute fulminant hepatitis, acute liver failure, then no immunosuppressive treatment where available right on to liver transplantation. If there's acute severe defined by jaundice, INR 1.5 to 2, first manifestation, no hepatic encephalopathy, then, sorry, then, then uh, bretnisone should be used, not budesonide. Uh, and a monotherapy, if there's no response within two weeks, at the latest, there should be transplantation. Here, as a more detailed uh, dosage regimen, you should use monotherapy with a higher dosage than in combination. And the American guidelines acknowledge that budesonide can be used in non cirrhotic patients as a topical steroid. I will come back to this. The azathioprine dosage is different used in the USA. You use flat dose of 50 milligram in Europe. It's one to two milligram of kilogram body weight. And then we have side effects. We have uh, sometimes um, uh, <coughs> side effects that we have to um, monitor and that we have to change treatment. And for example, in steroids, up to 80% have either cosmetic or somatic side effects. You are all aware with those and familiar with those. So this is a high percentage. And um, therefore, the idea came to use a topical steroid, budesonide, which is well established in lung diseases uh, or in inflammatory bowel disease. Dr. Danielsen from Sweden first introduced it uh, in, in liver diseases. And this is a study published in 2010. It's the only prospective randomized controlled trial. And the endpoint was after six months, normalization of ALT, normalization of ALT, and at the same time, lack of predefined steroid specific side effects. You see superiority of the buddhisonide plus ethocyber. And after six months, the double blind placebo controlled group was opened. You see here that not only there was a combined endpoint, but also was a favor for budesonide in the biochemical remission, not in the pediatric, only in the adult population. But then after six months, um, the patient's double blind phase was stopped and patients on prednisone were switched to budesonide, all in combination with azathioprine. And here you see that after at six months, 40% of the prednisone group had side effects and they were reduced to 18.4% after 12 months. So switching from prednisone to budesonide decreased steroid specific side effects. In children, uh, the most important aspect was weight gain. Children significantly gained weight. And after ch switching from prednisone to budesonide, <clears throat> then uh, there was a reversal of the weight gain. So the role of budesonide is to use it instead of prednisone, prednisone to you in combination with azathioprine to reduce side effects in those uh, who are at risk and to use it for long-term remission. It's approved in 25 European and 17 non-European. Uh, the American guidelines, there was this paper by Dr. Mack and the American guidelines, they, uh, uh, they ordered a uh, Mayo Clinic group to do a um, systematic review analysis and meta-analysis. And they, for a look, they asked 
three questions, three standard PICO questions were raised to underline the evidence for the ASLD guidelines. And initially they started with 1,712 publications. They decided that only 578 uh, were, were meeting the criteria that they allowed to have full text article analysis. And these colleagues from Mayo Clinic uh, read these 578 articles and came up that for the question number one, what is the best first line treatment? They came up with two papers and what is the best second line? Also two papers. And there was a third question, whether to stop steroids after transplantation. And here on the right side, you see um, you, the database. So it's very, very small for evidence, but you see here that there is almost no difference between prednisone and acestibrin compared to bolisonide and acestibrin. Only two studies were selected that meeting the quality criteria and uh, superiority of Buddhism for side effects. Should not be used in cirrhotics because in studies with PBC there was portal vein thrombosis or individual case with Budchiari and the first pass effect is lost in portal hypertension. When we look at second line treatment, certainly Buddhism is not a drug for second line treatment. We are lacking at missing long-term data. Initial data come from the Hamburg group showing that some patients who received Buddhism for intolerance for prednisone, half of them achieved remission and they showed improve of bone density. There's another question and then I stop with the steroid story. And this is very interesting because the Dutch group, they have shown that the high dose of prednisone or prednisone we use may not be necessary. They traveled through Europe and looked at different centers and have shown that there is concerning biochemical remission, no statistical difference whether you have 0.5 per, per kilogram per day or less or more. You should not use uh, uh, buddhistonite in acute severe. Now, what is real world? What is real world? And there's studies from England. There is a consortium on England called hepatitis. Uh, they have more than 25% of all patients with autoimmune hepatitis in the UK. Dr. Dyson is first author, David Jones is the last author from Newcastle. And here you see how heterogeneous the treatment in everyday life is. Even in England, where they're well familiar with the progressive treatment of autoimmune liver disease, uh, that you have a whole variety of spectrum that people use in first line treatment. And what is even more is that despite all the guidelines, and what you see even more is that the response rates are limited. We still read in textbook that up to 80% achieve a biochemical remission. But you see in first line treatment here, much less than 80% is achieved whatever regimen you use. So this really shows us that we need to have standardized treatment and we have to improve treatment autoimmune hepatitis. So if patients do not tolerate or do not respond to first line treatment, what can we use for salvage? We discuss the steroid business. Now we discuss also the uh, isocyaprin story. You see also isocyaprin may have side effects up to 50%, especially in cirrhotic patients. This is a meta-analysis of those comparing MMF as second line treatment. Many guidelines recommend MMF, mycophenolate as second line treatment. Some authors also recommend it as first line treatment. And this uh, analysis also concludes that MMF presbyterism may be superior to standard of care. And then otherwise the data show that MMF is useful as second line treatment, but in particular, if there's intolerance to acetylcyprin. What does the ASLD guideline say? This is the second paper with all the systematic review and meta-analysis data that are the basis for the guidelines published by Dr. Mark. And here you see that Tacorimus and MMF are both uh, similar in its efficacy as second line treatment. However, they also state that MMF should be preferred if there is intolerance to acetylcyprin. Now, this is an algorithm taken from, uh, from, a, from the, uh, the um, rare liver disease, ERN. We have a new system in Europe, the European Reference Networks. And th this is, these are consortia for rare diseases, standardized treatment where significant 
uh, multi-center trials and prospective randomized controlled trials are not available. This is now an algorithm. Dr. Lohs is first author. He's the chair of the uh, reference network. We're also a member of the reference network here, ERN, Rare Liver. And here it's clear, standard of care steroids plus minus acetabrin. If there is intolerance, mycophenolate is favored, but also this one or, cyclo, uh, or cycloneuron inhibitors, maybe tacrolimus. And if they fail, then you, we need to use third line treatment. And third line treatment here is now are the biologicals in the focus. And this is the last part of my talk. There's infliximab TNF antibodies. However, they cause in particular difficult to treat patients infectious complications. Lately, rituximab anti-CD20, anti-B cell antibodies were used. And I want to concentrate on the biologicals. This is a multi-center retrospective analysis. Our center has contributed to patients from Germany. They are from United Kingdom, from Canada, and from Germany. And rituximab was used two times one gram, two weeks apart, anti-CD20. And you see no serious side effects, and you see a reduction in aminotransferases, improvement in immunoglobulins. 71% had no flares after 24 months and 62, two third could use a steroid reduction. So overall, the rituximab is promising on, on addition to TNF antibodies, and it's now wide explored. I want to discuss now ongoing studies because this B-cell approach is of interest. And there is VAY736. This is an antibody uh, with a dual approach. CD20 is only on B-cells and not on plasma cells, but this antibody uh, targets B cells and the buff receptor. And therefore, it has a dual approach diminishing pathogenetic B cells and diminishing uh, the differentiation into long lived plasma cells. Uh, there's an ongoing study with this uh, Ian, Ianulumab BAY 736. And hopefully, the, despite all the corona crisis, that the recruitment will be finished by the end of the year. And hopefully we have another randomized controlled trial uh, for those patients who fail standard of care. Now, some at the very end, some experimental approaches. I mentioned at the pathological studies, low dose IL-2, two patients from London. One did not change uh, ART levels, but here this patient significantly improved ART, and the TMAX were given IV to these patients. Then this is very interesting. Here from five patients, T-Rex were isolated, were labeled. And then you can see that if you infuse these patients, then they, uh, the, they target the liver in home in the liver and are retained in liver and spleen. So it will be interesting to see in the future this anti-B cell strategy, low dose IL-2 and the application of T-Rex, whether they will help us to also achieve complete remission in all of our patients and avoid liver transplantation. So I thank you very, very much for your attention. Before closing, this is my very last slide. You see that if you stop treatment, the recommendation is normalization of ALT, normalization of IgG, inactive cirrhosis, uh, inactive histology, you can stop treatment. But then 80% relapse within three years. So this really shows that relapse is almost universal. We need long-term, mostly lifelong treatment, and therefore have to work on better therapies to achieve remission in all. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, sir. And now we can start with our discussion. Uh, we have many questions coming, but let's start with the diagnosis. Which methodology we should use for testing the autoantibodies? Because many labs are using ELISA, um, yes. which might be problematic. Yeah, uh, I think uh, I think this is a very very good question, because in Europe uh, people love autoantibody testing, people love immunofluorescence, and uh, uh, I know that in particular in America, for example, and this has been a big discussion with the guidelines. Uh, they send the serum to pathology laboratories where ELISA is used. 
So I think um, uh, they, they are useful, but autoantibodies bodies are just part of the diagnosis. I think uh, there's a difference between Europe where we use immunofluorescence, we use rodent tissues where you can see all three, SMA, ANA, mitochondria, but in America it's everyday practice to use ELISAs, which you can use for ANA, but you have other limits, other titers, <coughs> uh, which are not evaluated. Yes, sir. And there is also a problem of false uh, tra tissue transglutaminase, TTG test, if patient is especially cirrhotic. So how to tackle that issue, sir? Yeah, uh, I think this is celiac disease. Uh, I mean, uh, the TG antibodies there are for celiac disease. Um, mainly, mainly the false positive tests are due to hypergammaglobulinemia. And I think these tests have to be adjusted. I think uh, they have not been validated enough for this population of patients. And in particular, in autoimmune hepatitis, you may have a coincidence of celiac disease as you have in PBC. And therefore, these tests have to be validated for these conditions. Right, sir. And uh, what do you think about the AIH scores? Uh, are they applicable in cases of severe autoimmune hepatitis or fulminant hepatitis or even ACLF? Can they yeah. be applied there? Uh, no, I, say, uh, I think, first of all, this was also a discussion we had with the ASLD guidelines. And um, I think the scoring systems <clears throat> not in severe acute. And I think uh, you should only use them in chronic indefinite cases, but mainly for trials and for, for defining cohorts. I think at the end of the day, you have the individual decision on a patient, uh, whether you give immunosuppression or not, and then immunosuppression is part of the diagnostic procedure. Right, sir. And um, we mostly see that acute severe AIH or fulminant are mainly seronegative, as more, more as compared to the chronic hepatitis cases. So what's the reason for that? And uh, how do we suspect such cases. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is this is very difficult. Uh, I think if they are, I mean, some in the, in the children you have very you have often the LKM positives. I mean, the LKM of, uh, positives in the pediatric population uh, some uh, often uh, manifest as acute severe or acute hepatitis. Uh, uh, you have to look at IgG. You have to look at IgG. And you have to start immunosuppressive treatment. I think here immunosuppressive treatment is, is a very important part uh, of the diagnostic procedure, but you have to use steroid monotherapy, not budesonide, and wait with acesiabin. Right, sir. Now there is one question about uh, how do we decide that patient is not responding to immuno first line immunosuppressive therapy in cases of acute severe hepatitis, fulminant hepatitis and ACLF. Yes. Because patient is having jaundice, how do we monitor them and say that enough, now we should not stop steroids and yeah. consider liver transplant or... Yeah, so first of all, in, in, acute, in acute liver failure uh, with encephalopathy with a full the criteria you should not wait too long there you should primarily go for transplantation in acute severe it, it says at least two weeks and in two weeks you should see improvement and you also have not only to look for biochemical parameters you have to look for um, INR you have to look for the various parameters of, of liver function and cephalopathy I think um, you should see some improvement in, in two weeks yeah and then you have the acute on chronic liver failure. Yes. Um, here, here, I think you, you should have biopsy. I think if the clotting is deficient, then you may, must, we do transjugular biopsies. Yeah. And I think uh, <clears throat> there the biopsy is very important to diagnose acute on chronic liver failure. Yeah. yeah. And uh, is there any role of steroids in decompensated cirrhosis? And, uh, uh, okay, uh, I very rare, very rare. <coughs> so the only reason is that you have, for example, a high ALT and that you rule out any viral infection, also acute hepatitis B. And if you're really sure that the inflammatory activity caused to autoimmunity, uh, then then you could could use this. Otherwise, the risk of infection is too high. Yeah. 
now there is one question about uh, pediatric aih how does the response rate in pediatric aih is different from the adults is there less responsive pediatric aih and why yeah okay um the re response criteria are the same <coughs> it is the same it is alt and igg something what is specific in the pediatrics is the proportion of patients having cirrhosis at the time of diagnosis is higher so so therefore the pediatrics they they say that the biopsy is mandatory number 2 is in particular if they are cholestatic but also recommended by the pediatrics even if they are not cholestatic you should rule out a, a sclerosis and cholangitis so one of the re I mean, and then you have very frequent LKM antibody positive, which may have fulminant. They have high rate of extra hepatic manifestations. The response rate is lower. The relapse rate is higher. And you have to be sure that there is no cirrhosis. Yeah, we have many more questions. One is from Santosh Kumar. He asks, any role of pulse methylprednisolone in acute fulminant hepatitis with suspected AIH? Uh, methylprednisolone? methylprednisolone okay yeah. yeah we we don't use it but i think it's it's uh, handling the same receptor if you are used to use methylprednisolone i think you can take it can take okay uh, this question is from... these sorry in this situation you should use what you're used to do yeah you should in yeah. these acute cases not try something that you're not familiar with right sir right sir so um, this is a question from Dr. Turkanu. How we approach the patient with hepatic steatosis associated with autoimmune hepatitis? Okay. Is there any difference? Yeah. Very, okay. So this is a very, very good question for various reasons. Number one, um, we, we see now up to 30% overlap between autoimmune hepatitis and, and NAFLD. Number two is autoantibodies. In particular, if the patient is older, above 40, 50, and is a woman, you may have ANA. Uh, then the question again, is it cirrhotic or not? Then IgG and gamma globulins can be helpful here. Um, and, and then you need to have the biopsy. If the patient has high ALT, 300, 400, has high IgG and significant autoantibodies, you can try immunosuppression. Otherwise, I would first try to do weight reduction. Right, sir. Difficult well, case. Uh, yeah. Another question from Dr. Bokobo. So he is asking whether liver biopsy is a must for diagnosis despite increased IgG, ANA, asthma positive in a classical female patient with increased ALT and negative for all viral markers. So okay. Is it a mandatory? We Yes. Okay. We we recommend we recommend biopsy, and the argument is that uh, uh, we want to exclude other pathologies, and uh, we want to support the diagnosis, and we want to have it for follow-up biopsies. We want to exclude significant fibrosis. On the other hand, if such a patient no signs of cirrhosis, high ALT, high autoantibodies, high IG, if he refuses biopsy, yeah, then we would still treat him. Okay. In the um, adult, it's not as strong the recommendation as our pediatrics colleagues are. Okay. So now there is a question from Dr. Dhaneshwar. He asks, because there is a high relapse up to 80% in three years, so should we continue steroids plus as a for prolonged time or probably maybe a lifetime? Yeah. And how should we decide when to stop the therapy yes. or consider stopping therapy? Very good. Okay. Very good question. First of all, the longer the patient is in remission, the lower the probability of relapse. So two or better three years, continuous full remission, ALT, IgG. Uh, and you see, for example, from this paper from UK, you see uh, there are 50, 60 percent on remission. That patients are 80 percent in full remission is wrong, you know. But I would say I would give it a chance. If somebody is three years ALT, IgG normal, has on biopsy, no histological activity, I would give it a try. If the patient then relapses, I normally in women do not stop treatment 
maybe after menopause, giving it another try. Otherwise, lifelong. Okay. There is an interesting and again a question from on pediatric AIH from Tingwa Lam. He's asking whether MRCP is an adequate cholangiogram for pediatric AIH or whether ERCP is a must. I would I would say in these days MRCP. I would I would favor yeah. MRCP. I must say the technology has improved and ERCP in children. Uh, there are significant still the pancreatitis issue. Um, we do a lot of ERCPs at our center, in particular in neonates with, with jaundice to exclude or diagnose uh, <coughs> the, the, the uh, biliary atresia. But uh, here, first of all, I would do a, a, a MRCP. Okay, sir. Uh, there is one question. Can rituximab be used in severe autoimmune hepatitis? Are there any studies or? No, or... no. I mean, first of all, there are very limited data, but I think this is still experimental. Not if none of the second line treatments are approved, one must say. Uh, I would give steroids because, I mean, you cannot, uh, it takes longer. We, we discussed before that you should see improvement within two weeks and otherwise think of transplantation. Yeah. So I think we took, first of all, no data. Number two, I think we need a rapid response, and there I would prefer first line uh, steroids. And rituximab is not evaluated uh, for first line treatment, it's evaluated for second line. Another interesting question, sir, from uh, Dr. Selena Andrada If there is superimposed acute hepatitis E, when to initiate the steroid therapy? Because many viral hepatitis cases, A or E, will have autoantibodies positive. Yes. Very, very interesting. Number one is we have published from Germany that the antibody titers for E are rather high in autoimmune hepatitis. So uh, I was, although I am a co-author, I was very critical with this because uh, many years ago, measles antibodies, EBV antibodies, many viral antibodies are increased in uh, autoimmune diseases. Um, but in acute E, uh, if there is acute E with RNA positivity, I would wait with, uh, with steroid treatment. I mean, we, we use ribavirin, yeah. Um, we try ribavirin in E patients, um, but uh, I would, uh, we also published on this. Uh, I would not give immunosuppression if there is detectable HEV RNA. Okay, sir. One interesting question is regarding drug-induced liver injury. Okay, I tell you, another is, 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 uh, exception could be, for example, if you wait and if uh, this develops a chronic cause and the chronic cause has no cirrhosis, hypergamic globulins and autoantibodies, yeah, then the discussion comes whether this is an hepatitis E triggered autoimmune disease, but very, very rare. I have not seen convincing cases so far. Sorry. Okay. Uh, how, how to differentiate drug-induced liver injury from autoimmune hepatitis and drug-induced liver injury induced autoimmune hepatitis? Yes, very good. Okay, this is, I mean, autoimmune liver disease, we think you have a genetic background and it's triggered. The triggers are viruses and we know it's not only one trigger. Uh, hepatitis A may cause autoimmune hepatitis. This is documented in the literature. Hepatitis E has been documented. Drugs. The old day, uh, thiolinic acid, dehydrolysin, uh, they can cause. So drugs, chemicals, and you know that the LKM antibodies and the LKM antigen, which made my life interesting, you know, they are drug metabolizing. Um, so drugs may cause, or drug may cause, but if you have to, uh, ongoing treatment with drugs, you have to stop. Okay, another question is very interesting, and this is, Immune-mediated liver disease caused by biologicals, and and and, and TNF antibodies they can cause autoimmune hepatitis, and then you have the checkpoint inhibitors, and we see now an increasing number of publications. I think five percent of patients, also cancer patients, being treated with checkpoint inhibitors, develop an immune-mediated liver disease. And I think whether this is autoimmune hepatitis, I doubt it, but certainly it's immune-mediated 
and steroids are shown to improve liver function. But I think we should distinguish the classical drug induced with by chemicals from these uh, uh, biologicals that intervene with the immune system. Here we will see more data in the future to come, the more we use checkpoint inhibitors and all kinds of indications. Uh, there is a, another question from Dr. Supta Shri. So he asks whether TPMT test is mandatory before azathioprine use in okay. every cirrhotic patient. Okay. Number one, we don't do it in Germany. I mean, we discuss it, but we don't do it. Yeah? In America, they do it more and more, and uh, they recommend it. So the, uh, this is new. Uh, 2010 guidelines did not recommend it, <laughs> but the committee made a strong point that in particular cirrhotic patients should be done. And uh, is there any way to check compliance of azathioprine therapy? Whether the patient is taking that or not? Not really. Not, not in everyday practice. Not in everyday practice. Okay. So maybe we can take one last question because we are running out of time. So gut microbiome changes have been recently observed in patients with AIS. So what, what do you think is the potential role of gut microbiota modulation in treating patients with autoimmune hepatitis? Okay. So this is very, very interesting. I mean, microbiome study is uh, has a hype. Yeah. So it's in. Um, it will be, I mean, it's too early uh, to, to do microbiome transportation or fetal uh, transplantation in autoimmune hepatitis. Uh, I wouldn't. I think the data are too scarce, and then we discuss this overlap with NASH. Uh, we know that the microbiome has a significant role in NASH, um, but we have now ongoing studies in inflammatory bowel disease, and I think we have to see these other conditions. What comes out here? It's potentially interesting, but here I would like to see also evidence in mouse. There are mouse experiments for autoimmune hepatitis before giving that in patients. Uh, and then we have, for example, first of all, we have standard of care. I would not use it as an alternative to the standard of care that we have now. The standard of care is working. I would only think if there if there's a desperate case with high inflammatory activity where none of the therapies work, but I think it's too early. The basic data um, are scarce. And I think we will see first progress in other diseases like in ulcerative colitis. Okay, so one, one last question I would take. Um, how do we reduce AIH recurrence post liver transplant? Are there any specific strategies? Yeah, this is also a very interesting question because in these American guidelines, I, uh, there were these three PICO questions that were asked for evidence and meta analysis. And one was whether steroid should be continued or reduced. So, again, this. Um, Dr. Fearing was first author for this systematic review. These 1,712 papers where only two were eligible. Um, the message was, I mean, we had the consensus that in viral hepatitis undergoing liver transplantation, you should reduce steroids as early as possible. In autoimmune hepatitis, you should give to prevent recurrence. But this, uh, this Fearing hepatology paper of this year it's interesting that the scientific evidence is not there. So there's no difference in the data so far whether to reduce, whether to continue steroids or to stop steroids. I have in my patients, I favor it to continue, but also something which I all want to mention is the veganists, my friend Diego and Georgina, they, they, they describe de novo autoimmune hepatitis. Yeah? And I would say it's de novo immune-mediated hepatitis because it's not the patient's own liver. So it's not an autoimmune disease. It's an immune-mediated disease against the donor liver. The, the only thing which is own in the donor liver are the Kupfer cells and the endothelial cells, which invade after transplantation into the liver from the bone marrow, while the hepatocytes are the donor hepatocytes. And uh, they have been 20 years ago, the papers in Nature uh, we know that part of the bile ducts are exchanged, but the majority is a foreign, so it's immune mediated. And here, nevertheless, steroids work. Okay. Um, there are many more questions, but in the interest of time, uh, I would like to thank Professor Michael Mans for 
attending this session and uh, making such a nice presentation we had a, such a lively discussion thank you very much sir for your time dr sharma i thank you i thank you very very much thank you very very much and to apasal and you and the organizers this has been a real pleasure and honor to to do this webinar with you greetings you. to asia to india to china to japan to mm -hmm. all of asia and whoever is watching in the world yeah thank you sir. special times right. special times thank you sir thank you bye 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 bye